Please turn to John chapter 10 this morning. At this point in the gospel, you, those of you that have been with us for the previous weeks or months now, I suppose, are well aware that the Lord Jesus has performed a number of miracles and signs and wonders and has gained quite a, a following. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, Victor Hugo once said, fame must have enemies, as light must have gnats. <laughs> Jesus had gnats, big gnats. They were called Pharisees, and uh, they didn't like Jesus. And so in chapter 5, you may remember, they resolved to kill him. And in chapter 8, they took up stones to stone him. And before we reach the end of chapter 10, they will try it one more time. Jesus had a bullseye on his back, and taking aim on him was the religious establishment. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you will grant us wisdom, insight, understanding, faith, uh, belief. Lord, help our unbelief. Uh, grant that we may see once again your great faithfulness to your people and the greatness of your salvation. Indeed, how shall we escape if we neglect it? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. John 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. In chapter 9, you may remember last week, we saw Jesus heal the man who was born blind. Quite a miracle. No one did that in the Old Testament. No one did it after Pentecost. It was a clear sign, a signal that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. And as he healed the man's eyes, he also healed his heart and healed his soul. And he became a believer. Lord, I believe was his simple 
but beautiful profession of faith in verse 38. However, because he became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, those, those gnats, known as the Pharisees, were unhappy and promptly excommunicated this man from the synagogue, prompting the Lord Jesus to introduce some uh, sheep farming metaphors to illustrate his faithfulness as a good shepherd and to contrast himself with those Pharisees. So three things I draw to your attention this morning. First of all, there's only one door. There's only one door that leads to life. Verses seven through nine. Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find a pasture. The thieves and the robbers were those gnats, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the religious leadership, that establishment. They were not leading their people in the way everlasting. They were false shepherds, the sort that Ezekiel described, who took care of themselves and neglected the needs of the sheep under their care. They fed themselves. They, uh, they looked after their own needs. And uh, so it was a problem in Ezekiel's day, and it was a problem in Jesus' day, and it's a, pro <laughs> it's a problem in our day too. I suppose there always will be those in leadership, men and women, in churches and uh, denominations who are far more interested in, in propagating their own name and their own career as opposed to advancing the kingdom of God. And uh, so it was with uh, these uh, thieves and robbers as Jesus uh, described them. They didn't visit the sick. They didn't care for the needy. They didn't uh, uh, love the helpless or help the helpless. They, uh, they were living, as Jimi Hendrix used to sing, remember that song? I'm living in a room full of mirrors. All I can see is me. Narcissists, we would call them today. Jesus, by contrast, took care of his sheep. He fed those hungry multitudes, you recall. Uh, he healed the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He was a faithful shepherd who looked after his sheep. Unfortunately for Jesus, as Mark Twain said years ago, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. And that was Jesus. Always a good example, always doing deeds of love and mercy. And therefore his, his church grew. And the Pharisees, the gnats became extremely jealous when Jesus healed the lame man, been lame for 38 years in chapter five, they persecuted him. When uh, Jesus healed the man born blind in chapter nine, they mocked him. They mocked Jesus. Later, they criticized Jesus for receiving sinners and eating with them. Can you imagine anything worse? I think that's the gospel. I think that's great news. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He receives sinners and eats with them. But it didn't matter what Jesus did. If he healed the sick and saved the lost, the Pharisees, the religious leadership did not rejoice. Because they didn't care about those people. They cared about themselves and their reputations and their standing and their prominence and their positions of leadership and even their, I use the word, power. Power over the people, the stranglehold they had as they, they laid one burden after another upon them. And they said, do this and don't do that. And, and if they did enough of it, often enough and well enough, they might merit God's favor. And so no wonder Jesus said, you're... you're your yoke is hard, your burden's heavy. My yoke is, is easy, my burden's light. 
And so because these Pharisees were living in a room full of mirrors, that door, their door, if you will, was a dead end. Didn't lead to life. Remember the name Robert Tilton? Some 30 plus years ago, he, uh, uh, he had a large ministry, a large following, and he, he asked his uh, congregation, I don't know what the right word is, he asked them to send in prayer cards, prayer request cards. He, he mailed the card to them, they filled it out, and they, there was a return envelope. Uh, the P.O. box was a bank in Dallas. And so it was kind of understood that you were to send money to make a financial donation to the ministry along with your prayer request card. Well, that's all right. The problem was that ABC Primetime Live did a little investigation and found the bank taking the money and depositing the money and taking the prayer cards by the basketful and dumping them in the dumpster out back. That's what thieves and robbers do because they don't care about the people. In this case, they cared about the money. Normally, the thieves and robbers are a little bit more subtle than that. But the point is, Jesus is the only door that leads to life. Go in through his door and you find pasture. One commentator writes of traveling in the Holy Land when he came upon a shepherd and his sheep and eventually the shepherd showed him the fold into which he would bring the sheep at night. And all it was was four simple walls with an opening. But there's no door. So the, shepherd, the, the, the commentator, the traveler said, there's no door. Where's the door? And the shepherd said, I am the door. When the light is gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in that open space and no sheep ever goes out but across my body and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. So you understand the, the metaphor Jesus was using. He protects his people. He provides for his people. He saves his people. He's the only door to life. Second, there's only one good shepherd as well. Verses 10 and 11, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It was rare in those days for a shepherd to die in the line of duty, but there was danger. You remember David spoke of fighting off lions and fighting off bears. Interestingly, the Jewish Mishnah, which is the, uh, the collection of rabbinical law from this particular time period, specified that if only one wolf attacked the flock, the sheep, the shepherd was required to defend the flock. But if two or more wolves attacked, or lions or bears or whatever, it was considered, considered, quote, an unavoidable accident, and the shepherd was allowed to run for his life. Jesus knew nothing of unavoidable accidents. He only knew unconditional love for you and me and for all of his people. And so he gave his life for the sheep unconditionally that we might have abundant life and everlasting life. You remember the name Pete Maravich. Here's another blast from the past. Pistol Pete. How many of you saw Pistol Pete play basketball? I did too. He was quite the player. At the age of seven, I saw a, a, a great video. You can watch it on uh, YouTube. It was a great video of Pete Maravich speaking at the Billy Graham Crusade in Columbia, South Carolina in 1987. And he sort of told his life story and said that at the age of seven, it was his goal to earn a college scholarship, to play in the NBA, to make a million dollars, and to acquire a 
championship ring. So in his own words, he became a basketball android. Basketball, 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 and he made it. And you remember he earned a scholarship to Louisiana State University, where one season he averaged 44 points per game. Scored 68 points uh, in one game, and I think to this day still holds the NCAA career scoring record, which is all the more phenomenal because freshmen weren't allowed to play in those days and there was no three-point line. So factor that in. Only three years to get it done and no three-point line and 50, 60 years later, he still holds the record for career uh, points in a college career. So Pete uh, made it big time. In 1970, he signed the largest contract in sports history. I believe it was with the Atlanta Hawks, but you can check me on that. And he enjoyed a very successful NBA career, though I don't think he ever won that championship that he wanted. Ten years later, he retired, 1980. And he retired despondent and even suicidal. It seems that when he was 14 years old, a friend of his offered him a beer to drink. And Pete initially declined because his father had promised to shoot him if he ever caught him drinking a beer. So he said no, but peer pressure, as you know, is a powerful thing. And soon enough, late one Sunday night on the steps of a Methodist church, he drank his first beer. And he, in his own words, it was a toehold, but it soon became a stronghold in his life. 1982, two years after he re retired, he was trying to sleep one night <clears throat> and having a hard time of it because things kept coming into his mind. Bad things. Sin. And this is what he told the audience in Columbia, South Carolina. I cried out, oh God, you've got to save me. I can't take this life anymore. I've had it with what they say makes you happy. And I heard a voice say, be strong and lift thine own heart. I was shocked. I sat up. And I wakened my wife, I said, Jackie, did you hear that? Did you hear what God said to me? She said, I didn't hear anything, Pete. And she laid her head back down. I rolled off the bed and I said, God, I know you're there and I want to change my life. Come into my life, take away my sin, change me like you want me to be. And then he said, it's been almost four and a half years since then, and I have never known the joy that I have tonight. I want all of you to know this tonight about Peter Maravich, that the change that came into my life was Jesus Christ. Next week, I will be inducted into the Hall of Fame. I'll get a big ring, but I wouldn't trade my position in Christ for a thousand NBA championships or a thousand Hall of Fame rings, or for one hundred billion dollars, there is nothing like the joy of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? What is that? That is the testimony of a man who heard the Good Shepherd. He heard, he heard the voice. And he went through the door. And he thought he had a great life. And by the world's definition, he did. He had it all. He had awards and he had fame. And he had his picture on all the magazine covers. And he had trophies galore. He had, my goodness, he had one trophy that was as tall as he, six feet, five inches tall. He kept it in his attic. Because as he says, trophies collect dust. That's what they do. 
He drove the best cars, Mercedes, BMW, Rolls Royce. And where did it lead him? What was that door? <laughs> that was a dead end. That was a door to despair. And finally he heard the good shepherd speak. We sang it earlier when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. And God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And he found something so much better than a million dollars in NBA championships and trophies. My sheep hear my voice. And Pete heard and he followed. And it's good that he did. Because less than nine months after he gave this testimony, he died. At the young age of 40, playing pickup basketball at the First Church of the Nazarene in Pasadena, California. There's only one door, and there's only one good shepherd. And finally, there's only one source of blessed assurance. It's in verse 16, I love these two words. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Our assurance is grounded in God's sovereign election. Jesus said, I have other sheep. You know who he's talking about? You and me. He already had us. He had us before hello, if I may say so. 2,000 years ago he had us. We didn't know it. We weren't around, of course. And you know why he could say that? Because long before Jesus walked the planet, the Father had us. Paul says before the foundation of the world, out of his mere free grace and love, he, he elected his people to everlasting life. So Jesus, Jesus already had us. He already had those 2,000 people that came into the sheepfold on the day of Pentecost. He already had the Ethiopian eunuch. He already had Saul who became Paul. He already had Cornelius the god -fearer. He already had the Philippian jailer. You know, we give so much attention to things around us, don't we? Politics, um, sports. Technology, these, are, these things are interesting. I, I enjoy them too. But they're just background noise. You know what the real story is? The real story is that Jesus has other sheep. The real story is that God is building his kingdom and you're, you and I are blessed to be part of it. God just uses that background noise to cause us to look up to get out of our room full of mirrors. So we despair no more. So we finally hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. We are here this morning worshiping the Lord because the Shepherd called and He gave us ears to hear. And His love was pitched upon us a long, long time ago. We've got abundant life because He had other sheep. <laughs> we share the Gospel because he still has other sheep. We see the kingdom of God advancing because we know he has other sheep. We know Jesus tarries because he has other sheep and those sheep will come, they will hear his voice. They will come inevitably, they will come inexorably, but they will come because his election is fixed and his call is effectual. And this, my friends, is where the world is going to the consummation of God's great salvation and the revealing of the kingdom of God. And whoever understands that has a lot of peace amid all the noise out there, the highs and lows of life. Whoever understands that this is where the world is going really understands the key and whoever doesn't understand it, 
no matter how much he or she may know, understands very, very little, if anything, of lasting significance and importance. God's salvation, God's kingdom is what it's all about. Amen. Father, we thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you for abundant life. Truly our cup runneth over. Thank you for everlasting life. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for blessed assurance that no one can snatch us from your hand, that, that the Father gave us to you, and we're saved not because of something we started or finished, but because of what you started and you will complete. We're saved not because of our ability to hold on to you or our ability to keep from backsliding. We are saved because you've elected us to be saved and not only complete the good work you've done, but promise that everything along the way works together for our good, that you will not let us fall away. You will keep us from falling and present us faultless before your presence one day with exceeding joy. So when the devil tempts us to despair and does tell us of guilt within us, give us grace to look upward, O oh Lord, and see him there who made an end of all of our sin. We thank you for the sinless Savior who died for us that we might go in and out and find pasture, that we might be protected and preserved and nurtured and loved and saved forever through Christ our Lord, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen.